spirulina is undeniably the food of the future. With its high protein and antioxidant content, this algae has one of the most interesting nutritional profile of all. And it is no secret to NASA that even started using it for its Mars missions or numerous NGOs that use it actively to save children from malnutrition. What if you started growing your own superfood right now in your kitchen so you'd always have access to the freshest nutrients first thing in the morning when you wake up? Having fresh spirulina at hand is a completely different experience when compared to the dried forms of it. It is refreshing and most importantly, it doesn't have any fishy smell or taste at all. That makes it perfect to be included in your favorite recipes to give them an extra boost in nutritional value. In this set of videos, I'll show you how to set up a simple and cost-effective system to start growing your own spirulina right in your kitchen. You'll gain access to all the tips and techniques to harvest the most clean and nutrient-dense spirulina. Start growing your own superfood today to take care of your body. Because at the end of the day, it's really the only place you have to live in. Spirulina, also called Arthrospira, is a blue-green algae or cyanobacteria commonly used as a dietary supplement or whole food. Algae are responsible for most of the Earth's oxygen. They are the reason why life took place in the oceans, providing the nutrients needed to sustain it. Which means it's probably safe to say that we are descendants of spirulina. Spirulina has been a reliable source of food for centuries, but its benefits got scientifically studied in the last 50 years and it slowly broke into the mainstream for health-conscious people. Algaes are at the lowest on the food chain. They don't require land and very few nutrition, but water, CO2 and sun, which makes them excellent foods of the future. Today, spirulina is at the center of studies by NASA to be used as a main source of food for its Mars missions. And it is also widely used as a treatment to save children from malnourishment in third world countries with only a tablespoon a day during a few weeks. Indeed, spirulina is one of the original superfoods because of its unique nutritional profile. It is one of the highest plant-based source of complete protein with all eight essential amino acids, as well as 10 of the 12 non-essential amino acids. It is also extremely high in beta-carotene, much higher than carrots, minerals such as iron and gamma-linoleic acid, amongst others. Spirulina is an excellent antioxidant. It is also proven to help detoxify the body of heavy metals and promote good gut bacteria. Some researchers think that spirulina helps for some cancers, diabetes, and is a great ally to HIV treatments, but studies have yet to prove it. Contrary to popular belief, spirulina is not a source of B12 for humans, since its B12 is not the same kind as the one our body needs. Some species of cyanobacteria produce BMAA, which is a neurotoxin. That could be of concern if you don't know where your spirulina comes from. BMAA is also found in sea organisms consuming blue algae. This study also found out that 94% of Chinese spirulina samples tested were contaminated with hepatotoxic microcystins toxins. Indeed, spirulina can be extremely nutritional, but most of it is grown in contaminated waters and some processing techniques can make it toxic. Main harvesting regions include Japan, with radiation from Fukushima power plant incident in 2011, China, with heavy metals, lead, mercury and arsenic, and India, where pollutants, pesticides and preservatives are commonly found in waters. So, growing your own spirulina will then ensure that you have an eye on the source, water, and nutrition used for your culture, which I think is the best option. Here's a list of what I'm using to grow my own spirulina at home. For this, you can use my checklist available in the course resources, so you'll know you have everything you need before starting.
In order to make your life easier, I also provided you with some Amazon links to the cheapest options based on your country, so you don't have to search for hours. Some kind of transparent container. Glass is always best, but you can use PET. Keep in mind that in average, one liter of culture is equal to one tablespoon of fresh spirulina. So 10 to 20 liter is a good starting point. A fresh spirulina culture. The one that I got can be diluted up to five times its volume, so keep that in mind for your container. I had to use a smaller one to grow my culture at first. Bottled water. Too much chlorine can kill your culture. You can use filtered tap water, but I went for the bottled option since it also reduces the risks of contamination. A medium mix. We are going to discuss that in the next chapter. A high thread count nylon or polyester cloth to harvest. 400 is ideal. You can try using a nylon stocking or coffee filters, but it makes the job harder. An aquarium heater. Water has to be kept at around 35 degrees Celsius for optimal growth. An aquarium pump to provide CO2 to your culture and make sure it gets mixed and sees the light. Some kind of LED light or a bright window. I use this one that was made for an indoor garden. Smart plugs or a timer switch if you want to automate your culture like I did. The aquarium pump and heater are optional, as well as the artificial light. You can have your culture in front of a bright window and mix it manually once or twice a day. It's just easier for you when your culture is taken care of automatically. It's now time to get your medium ready, since spirulina grows in very specific conditions, hence why it's not found in every single lake. We have to make sure that it has what it needs to grow. Two ways are now offered to you. Either you get all the ingredients and make your own mix, or you decide to buy a ready-made version of it. Here's a recommended recipe if you feel like playing chemist. You'll find all the links to get these ingredients online in the course description. For 10 gallons of water, you'll need 600 grams of baking soda, 75 grams of saltpeter, 38 grams of sea salt, 3.8 grams of DAP, which stands for ammonium phosphate or deammonium phosphate, 1 3 fourth of a tablespoon of iron supplement. You want it to get ready and bioavailable. So this will be mixed with a chelating agent like lemon juice or green tea before introducing it to the medium. And that's it for the medium. Please always remember to use food grade ingredients. If you wouldn't eat it, don't give it to your spirulina. You will also need to prepare a food mix without baking soda to fit it to your culture every time you take your spirulina out. This one you'll give your culture about half of the weight of wet spirulina you took out. So this food mix is composed of 93.3% of saltpeter, 3.3% of mono or diammonium phosphate, 2% of potassium sulfate, and 1.3% of Epsom salt. You'll find these recipe cards in the course description. Now that we have all we need, we can get a culture. Maybe you are a lucky one and you know someone that has fresh spirulina at home and can get some from them. Most people get theirs on Etsy or Amazon. You'll get a bottle full of dormant spirulina. The denser, darker it is, the more you can dilute it. Mine came with the instruction to dilute it up to five times its volume. Since I got a small bottle, I added it to one liter of liquid in order to be able to reach the minimum water level of my aquarium heater before moving to this one container I use now. When it comes to diluting your culture, I suggest not exceeding 15 centimeters of site depth. The more concentrated your culture is, the more it'll survive stress. This is important to know, especially at the beginning, since it has to get used to its new home. I'll show you how to measure site depth later. In order to make sure you have a backup of living spirulina in case you lose your culture, 
keep some of it in a half open bottle somewhere with no direct sunlight, giving it a bit of water and nutrition every two months or so. It's finally time to get your tank ready. I think that's the most exciting part, it makes me feel like uh, an interior designer. Start with the container of your choice. Make sure you did the math on how much spirulina you'd like to harvest. But no pressure, you can still move your culture to a new, bigger home later on when it gets stronger, which I always like to advise. Add to it the heater. Make sure it is well secured using the suction cups. You can also use a heating mat if you prefer. But I find temperature easier to manage with this option, since it has a built-in thermometer. Set it between 30 to 38 degrees Celsius. Spirulina is very resistant and can survive between 8 to 45 degrees Celsius. Studies found that the ideal temperature is at 35 degrees Celsius. Now you can add your air pump. I use this bubbling stone in order to avoid splashing and noise. Some people prefer using aquarium circulation pumps, but in my case, for the size of my container, this solution seems fine. I leave a link for the kind of pump I'm talking about in the description. And you're all set with the tank. You can now pour the desired volume of room temperature water and dilute in medium and then slowly add your culture to it. Make sure that your culture is also at room temperature. You don't want to shock it. When you're done, cover your container with the cloth to avoid contamination and place it in a moderately lit room avoiding direct sunlight for three days. Your spirulina has been in the dark for a while, so it's good to go slowly in order not to stress it. Your culture might create some strange patterns at first whilst it's getting used to its new habitat. That's normal. After a few hours, it'll have settled nicely. For the first 24 hours, I would advise not mixing it and not turning the air pump on. Spirulina is a pretty easy culture. As long as you watch after it, you should be of good start for a long and happy relationship and you'll learn to know what it needs to be well along the way. Here's a few things you should know right from the beginning. When in search of sun, spirulina produces oxygen, which allows it to rise to the surface. That means that if your culture is concentrated to the top, it's probably lacking light. In order to optimize growth, I like to set up a LED light like this one I got with an indoor kit. I set it up to turn on every hour for 45 minutes from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. These 15 minute breaks allow spirulina to rest a bit and it's been shown to improve growth rate. If your culture is in front of a window, you can hide up to one third of it with a sheet of paper or aluminum foil to give some shade to allow the spirulina to rest if it doesn't need sun anymore. As for the air pump, it turns on for one minute three times a day, mixing everything up and allowing all spirulina to enjoy the light whilst also providing some more CO2. Also, make sure you keep the levels in check since it'll naturally lose some water to evaporation over time. You can always add a bit more filtered water with the appropriate medium once in a while. I'd also advise checking its pH once in a while to make sure everything is going well and no bacteria or parasite is growing in the water. Since we used baking soda, the water should be very alkaline and only spirulina should thrive in that environment. Your pH should be at around 9 to 11. After around two weeks, your culture should be darker. That means there's more spirulina than what you started with. Congrats, you did it. It survived the trickiest part of the process. It's now time for you to measure its density to determine if it's a good time to harvest or not. For that, you'll need to buy or build what's called a seke disc. This contraption allows you to measure the site depth of your culture. In my case, I simply recycled a plastic cap that I poked on a graduated skewer. I'm slowly putting it in the water to measure the distance at which I cannot see it anymore. I like to filter spirulina out when my culture reaches around one and a half centimeter of depth. Leaving about a third of the culture unharvested, I know that I can get fresh spirulina about once a week at that rhythm. For that, you'll need your filter and a recipient to catch the liquid. I built that contraption for this course. I usually use my filter on top of a large pot. After a few minutes, you should be left with a muddy texture, 
this is your fresh spirulina. Some people like to eat it straight away, but I prefer to wash it. In order to get rid of anything that is not pure spirulina, rinse it with bottled or filtered water to which you'll add 1% of pure salt. This will allow to keep your spirulina intact. Pure water will make its cells break and leak their content. I like to repeat this process two to three times. This also helps with preservation, I feel like. Once your spirulina is rinsed, you can either consume it straight away or store it in the fridge for three days or more. As long as it doesn't smell, change color or texture, you should be good to go. Some people like to freeze it in a nice tray for convenience. You can now pour back the remaining liquid and give your culture the nutrition it needs to thrive. As a rule of thumb, I like to give back about half the weight of spirulina I took out. I hope you'll have as much fun as I did researching, testing and learning before making this course. I can't wait for you to share your progress with your culture in the comments. Please feel free to leave your questions and eventual tips about spirulina in the comments. I'll be happy to discuss and learn from you. Thank you so much for your time and remember to take care of your body because at the end of the day, it's really the only place you have to live in.